I'm Dr. Doug Wingate. I'm the Secretary Treasurer of the International Convention of Faith Ministries, and I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us here tonight for our Virtual Leadership Summit. And uh, of course, the ICFM is existing to inspire faith in the members and to to create a fellowship among us and to also offer encouragement to one another. And we pray that this summit will be that for you. Again, all of us desire to increase in our uh, leadership skills, both in life and in ministry. And we believe that there'll be some tools for each and every one of us here to gain and move forward. Uh, we want to provide fresh insight, spiritual insight, fresh ideas and practical wisdom. And so we know that God will have you glean something very beneficial out of these, these services. Well, tonight we have the president of ICFM, Dr. D Larry Allison, and the vice president of the ICFM, Dr. Jim Willoughby, that are gonna be addressing you and sharing their wisdom to you for this particular time. And boys, this is a needed time for us to be able to have uh, this particular meeting. So get ready. Uh, the summit is about to begin and it is starting right now. Yeah. 
what does ICFM mean to us? ICFM means a lot. It means I care for ministers. It means the organization that gave us the opportunity to be who we are, to be united with others that believe in the same that we believe in, that we share the same uh, gospel, the same gospel of love, the same gospel of faith. And in these moments, you know, that we're living in, we are so grateful of the opportunity to be part of this such a great and a blessing organization. So we want to thank you so much for this opportunity to say greetings from the South Florida community of um, and in the family of ICFM. Le damos gracias a todos que son los hispanos que estamos en ICFM y les comunicamos de que ha sido de gran bendición haberlos conocido a todos ustedes que ha sido una una forma de poder tener este esta unión como creyentes, como personas que estamos buscando cómo aprender de la palabra, aprender de la fe y esperar por Cristo que él viene pronto. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Well, good evening. I would like to take just a few moments tonight to talk to you about a subject that uh, a lot of ministers are dealing with and people in your congregations are dealing with this, and that is resolving conflicts. Now, conflict means different things to different people, and it has a root source. What we need to understand is when conflicts come, we're not dealing with people. We're dealing with the spirits behind the people because God created his people good. But sometimes people get into things that they shouldn't and, and they develop habits and, and they cause conflict. And when you have conflict in a ministry, when you have conflict in a church, it can really create a lot of problems. Now, Psalm 119, 165 says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall by any means offend them. Now, offense and offended people is part of the root of what causes conflicts. People get upset about things, and they start changing the way they do things, and the next thing you know, you have conflicts. Now, there can be conflicts between individuals in a church, but there can also be conflicts in your family that affect your ministry, and there's conflicts outside in your neighborhoods and various places. But see, God does not expect you to live with conflict. It's difficult to hear what God has for you in your life and, and what he has for you to teach when you're dealing with conflicts. So what I'm going to do tonight, and there's no way I can do this in just a short time that I have, but I'm going to give you an outline of how to resolve, not just deal with or to cover up or to understand, but to how to deal with conflicts and actually get them out of your life. I'm going to give you six steps, and the first one is you've got to get into the Word and get some hope that this conflict can be resolved. Too many times people are living with conflicts that they've lived with so many years that they have no hope that that conflict will ever be resolved. But there is hope. And God doesn't want you to just cope with things the rest of your life because it dulls your, your sensory, your spiritual sensitivity to the things of the Spirit. And that's what the enemy wants. The enemy wants to dull you down so that you just don't receive from God the way you should. And if you're not receiving from God, you're not going to be able to project what God has for the people that he's given you to minister to. You know, Romans 5.5 says, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So the first thing you need to do is get into the Word and get some hope, knowing that this conflict, whatever it is that you have, can be resolved. Next, you need to make it personal. It's not about everybody else. It's about you. And you've got to acknowledge that you can resolve this conflict. Understand that the Word of God is for you. Too many ministers, and I've been guilty of this in the past, and, and I, 
I don't want this to be in my life anymore, but God will give me a word that's for me, and I think that it's just for me to teach somebody else. See, he gives you, as a minister, God gives you something to preach, but there's times when he actually gives something to you that you're not supposed to preach, that you're just supposed to deal with. You need to make it personal. Understand that the word of God is for you and that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Number three, you've got to remove yourself from the conflict as much as possible. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 says, But we commend you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the traditions he received from us. You cannot control other people. You need to understand this. You cannot manipulate and control other people. That's witchcraft. You can pray for them. You can minister to them. But each person is in control of themselves. God gave you the fruit of the Spirit. When you were born again, God gave you the fruit of the Spirit. And it's love, joy, peace, nine parts of that fruit. And that last part is self-control. But you can't control other people. And when someone will not submit, when someone will not listen to godly teaching, when they are continu continually a, a thorn, then what you need to do is you need to remove yourself from that person. Now, that takes us to point number four. Just because you are removed from that person doesn't mean that you don't forgive that person. Forgiveness is a way of life for every Christian, and you've got to practice what you preach. You've got to forgive in the same way that you were forgiven. And some people say, well, if I forgive them, then that means that now they're going to be my best friend, and, and now I've got to hang out with them. No, forgiving them doesn't mean that you've got to bring them into your inner circle. Forgiving them doesn't mean that you have to uh, associate with them. It's, forgiveness is not about them, it's about you. You've got to forgive them in your heart. Just because you forgive somebody doesn't mean that they have to become part of your inner circle. But you do have to love for them, you've got to pray for them, and you've got to understand that they may not even deserve the forgiveness, they may not even want the forgiveness, but it's not about them, it's about you. You say, well, but you don't know what they've done. Well, let me ask you something. Are they any better than you? Jesus forgave you. Certainly, you can forgive them. Then, you've got to state your case with your words. You can't carry this around inside of you. You can't be bottled up all your life with a conflict. I talked to one of the ministers that... He's a good friend of mine. I talked to him this last week, and he said, you know, I've been dealing with this for years. And he was referring to a relationship with someone. He said, I've been dealing with this for years. And my thought was, why? Why deal with something when you've been given authority over all the power of the enemy? You've been told what to do. You can walk in the fruit of the Spirit. You have the gifts of the Spirit. Don't just deal with it. Take care of it. And don't allow this conflict to get inside of you. I've seen many preachers get bitter and actually walk away from the ministry because they allowed the conflict to get inside of them and they became bitter. You've got to love them. You've got to forgive them. But once again, that doesn't mean you have to allow them inside your circle. You know, some ministers need to develop the ministry of being able to tell somebody to depart. Not everyone in a, in a group is supposed to be in that group. Now, sometimes what you need to understand is you'll have somebody that's causing a conflict within your ministry or within your organization, and you may, in the natural, maybe your personality doesn't match with theirs, and you're thinking to yourself, they need to be out of this ministry or they need to be out of this church. It may not be that way. I've experienced over the years and almost 50 years of ministry that sometimes people aren't on the wrong bus. They're just in the wrong seat on that bus. And I've seen people who were a conflict in one area get moved to another area 
and shine and just be a, a, a great asset. So you need to be understanding and not let something get inside of you. The fifth thing is you've got to state your case with your words. You know, sometimes you may have to say it a thousand times before you get it inside of yourself. But you need to state your case. Silence is not golden. Jesus never said, think to the problem. No. Remember in Mark eleven twenty three, 23, Jesus said, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and believes in his heart that the things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. I shouldn't have to remind you of this as faith ministers, but life and death are in the power of the tongue, and that's not just something you preach to your congregation. Life and death are in the power of your tongue, and what you say is what you get. You need to understand that the world you're living in right now was formed by the words that you spoke yesterday. And the world you're going to be living in tomorrow is being formed by the words you're speaking today. Make your words align with the word. Jesus said, Jesus said that he never, he never said anything. He said he has never done anything unless the Father spoke it to him first. So if you want to have a ministry that's equal to Jesus, and some people say, well, that's, that's heresy to say that. No, Jesus said, the works that I do, you will do also, and greater works than these will you do. So if you want to have a ministry like the ministry Jesus had, if you want to have a ministry like Paul the Apostle or some of the uh, first century apostles, if you just want to have the ministry of a great man or woman of God, you've got to start hearing from God and saying what he says. Your opinion doesn't matter. God's opinion is it. And number six, you've got to continue to believe and confess in the face of what you feel or how it's received. Sometimes you've brought a person into your office, you've talked with them, and you thought you could just resolve everything by just telling them the truth, and, and then it didn't work out that way. They got up, they were mad. You cannot go by what people say. Many, many years ago, I preached a sermon on divorce. And I called it the D word, divorce. And I mentioned how Loretta and I had never talked about divorce. We talked about the M word a few times, murder, but we'd never talked about divorce. And that was, that was humor, somewhat. But I had this young man come into my office, and he was a worship team leader here at this church. And he came into my office and he said, Pastor, I just want you to know I love you. And this is Sunday morning right after the service. He said, Pastor, I love you. And I learned today I will never divorce this ministry that I'm connected to. I love this church. I love you. And I didn't see him that week. And the next Sunday, he was the worship leader at the Baptist church down the street. So you can't go by what people say. You've got to go by what the Word of God says. And when it comes to re resolving conflicts, my son said something to me a few years ago that it just keeps bubbling up inside of me. He said, he said Dad, there, there's an answer to every single question that you can ask in the ministry. There's one answer, and that is this. And I said, what is it, son? He said, be led by the Holy Spirit. So as a gospel minister, as a, as a member of, of this great minister's organization, this International Convention of Faith Ministries, I would say this to you. When there's conflict, the first thing you do is seek the wisdom of God. You know, these, there's several things that will happen when you do that. And uh, you'll start living without worry. You'll start living without fear. You'll eat the good of the land. And there'll be peace and commitment within your people, and there'll be contentment within your people. And you'll find that, that pastoring a church without conflict is wonderful. Traveling in the ministry and uh, 
Fellowshipping with other ministers without conflict is wonderful. But understand this. The enemy is out there, and as it says in John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He wants to steal God's anointing from you. He, he wants to destroy your ministry. He, he wants to take away everything that God is trying to do through you. But don't let that happen. Just remember this. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Remember this. He has given us authority over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm us. And when it looks like you can't make it, when it looks like everything is looking bad and, and you just don't know what to do, remember this. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. God bless you. Hello, everybody. I'm Kenneth Copeland. I want to talk to you for a moment about something that is very, very important and could be vitally important to your life and to your ministry. ICFM, International Convention of Faith Ministries. That's a ministry designed to literally lift men and women of God into a powerful place of faith and excellence. The ministry of ICFM has been in my heart really since 1978 when it was first conceived. In fact, I became a member of ICFM on the very first day of its existence. And I'm more excited about it now than I was back then. The ministries God has brought together in this fellowship understand the need we all have to encourage one another. And the Bible says faith words nourish. This fellowship is designed to do that. Hello everyone. We're excited about our upcoming ICFM regional meetings. Now, as you know, our annual international convention has been rescheduled for next year in June of 2021 in Dallas, Texas. And we wanna encourage everyone this year to make a special effort to attend the meetings in your region. ICFM is a fellowship of churches and ministries that exist to inspire faith and provide encouragement and equipping for leaders. And this is why it's so important for us to stay connected. Our regional convention schedule is as follows. The Eastern Regional Convention will be held August 13th through 14th at the Greenville Community Christian Church in Greenville, North Carolina. The South Central Regional Convention will be held August 31st through September 1st at Houston Faith Church in Houston, Texas. The Central Regional Convention will be held September 10th through the 12th at Family Worship Center in Columbia, Missouri. The Southeast Regional Convention will be held September 14th through the 15th at New Life Family Worship in Punta Gorda, Florida. The Southwest Regional Convention will be held September 20th through the 21st at the Household of Faith Family Church in Orange, California. The North Central Regional Convention will be held October 12th through the 13th at Christian Life Church in Delavan, Wisconsin. And the Northwest Regional Convention will be held November 9th through the 10th at Life Change Church in Seattle, Washington. Again, we ask all of our members to make a special effort to attend these regional conventions and be sure to invite other pastors, ministers, and leaders to attend with you. For more information, please visit our website at icfm.org or call 877-348-4236. We love you and we look forward to seeing you this fall. Hello and welcome to uh, this session of the ICFM Leadership Summit. I want to dive right into my uh, subject this evening of balancing life and ministry. The reason I believe this is so important is because in over 45 years of full-time ministry, I have seen many examples of individuals who didn't do a very good job of this and it resulted in some disastrous conclusions. In fact, to be honest with you, uh, many years ago, I was guilty of it as well. You know, first I, I want us to uh, address something for a pastor or a traveling minister, this question that is 
quite frequently asked, what is normal? What does normal look like for your life as a minister, as a pastor? You know, I remember a number of years ago, I, I told my wife one day, I said, honey, when I finish this project, we will do that. She looked at me and said, Jim, when you get through this project, you'll already have another project going. You know, and, and she was right, in fact, because let's face it, most of us in ministry are driven individuals. We're driven by projects, we're driven by events, uh, we're driven by building programs, just ministry in general, and the list could go on and on and on. So how do we balance this thing called ministry and this thing called life that we are in the midst of? And of course, I'm talking about how do we balance it without quarantining ourselves, all right? So number one, let's jump into it here. The first thing I want you to understand is something that is very important called the schedule. The schedule. You have to have a schedule. And you've got to stick to it and make it work for you. You see, a schedule should be your best friend. You know, one of my early mentors in ministry uh, is a very successful pastor named Tommy Barnett. Love that guy. And, and he's accomplished so much for the kingdom. And I remember one day, he looked at me and he said, Jim, Christ died for the church, so you don't need to. And you know what? It, it was an eye-opener. Because w what he was saying is that Jesus gave his life. You don't have to die trying to fulfill some project or, or, or meet somebody's need or, or do something in relationship to ministry. You know, As I said, we are driven individuals and many are putting in 12 to 15 hours a day in ministry-related function. You know, we're meeting people at 8 o'clock at night to offer counseling, all while our personal life, our family life, our marriage life suffers. And that's exactly what I was talking about earlier, because that was me some 40 years ago. And uh, you have to have a schedule and make it work for you. It can protect you. Understand that. Someone comes to you and they... They say something like this, Pastor, can we meet with you on Thursday night at 8 p.m. for counseling? I tell them, let me check my schedule. And then I get back and say, I'm sorry, but I have something already on Thursday evening. How about we meet Thursday afternoon? You see, you don't have to tell them that what you have on your schedule is being home with your spouse, going to your kid's baseball game going to your daughter's piano recital, is that yes, you have something on your schedule that is important and priority. And so here's the point that my mentor made to me many years ago when he made that statement. And he said this, he said, they'll take off work if necessary to see their dentist, their doctor, their attorney, their tax person, but your schedule is not that important. And so I want you to know that your schedule should be your best friend. If you're going to balance life in ministry, you need to have a schedule. Here's the second thing. Study and prayer time. All right? Study and prayer time. Now... I really shouldn't need to say too much about this, about how important study and prayer time is for you and I. We're all familiar with Paul's writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, where he says, Be diligent to present yourself approved, one who can rightly divide the word of truth. Uh, and so we understand that. And one thing that I believe this year has done for many of us, is it's given us more study and prayer time with the stay-at-home orders that 
many of us were living under for uh, two or three months. And so I want to encourage you, you've got to set aside time for research, set aside time, set aside time for study, for prayer. And, and listen, I, I've met some ministers, the only time they study is in preparation for a message. We need to have more than just preparation time. You need prep time, but you need some personal time that you get into the Word of God for yourself, all right? So if we're going to balance life and ministry, here's the third thing I want to talk to you about uh, uh, this evening because it is, it is so critical. I'm going to write the word delegate, all right? Delegate, delegate. Let me drive that home. What are you doing that could be done by someone else? What are you doing that could be done by someone else? See, we all have got different projects on the table. And uh, recognize that there are three types of projects or three types of activities. Uh, number one, high yield. High yield. These are projects that produce the most beneficial results. High yield. Number two, medium yield. These are projects that produce good results, okay results. And then number three, low yield. These are projects that produce menial results. It's what I call the low hanging fruit. What do you mean by that, Jim? Quite simple, anyone can do it. Anyone can do it. So what are you spending your time on? Low yield projects, medium yield projects, or high yield projects? See, is that you ought to be focusing your time on those high yield projects. And that, think about this. What are you doing that if you stopped doing it, nothing would change or nobody would really notice. Think about that one today. What are you doing right now that if you stop doing it, nothing would change, nobody would really notice the difference? Then I would venture to say that is probably the third category, a low yield project. Here's a second question for you tonight. What are you doing that you could train someone else to do? What are you doing that you could train someone else to do? See, the purpose of delegation, to delegate, the purpose of delegation is so that you can take those few hours in a day that you have. And let's, let's face it, time is limited. I don't care what you do, I don't care who you are, You've got 24 hours in a day, and that is it. You can't stretch it out. You can't add any to it. You've got to sleep a certain amount of hours. You have a certain amount of hours you're going to spend getting dressed, eating breakfast, eating lunch, eating dinner. You've got all these different things. So when you recognize I've got a limited amount of time to do these projects in, so you've got to determine that, hey, I want to take this time, I want to focus on high yield projects or high yield activities. So in order for me to do that, I need to delegate the low yield and the medium yield projects to somebody else. Remember the Apostle Paul told Timothy, he said to his spiritual son, commit these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others. So listen, you've got individuals you can delegate things to and that so that you can do the high yield projects, all right? So let's talk about number four, all right? Number four, I'm going to simply write the word peers. Peers. Now you may think this one is an interesting, you, it may catch you by surprise, but I think this is a, a healthy habit for ministers, getting together with peers. 
Meeting with, uh, if you're a pastor, meeting with other pastors. If you're a traveling minister, meeting with other traveling ministers and vice versa, all right? It is that meeting with those ministers for fellowship, for encouragement. You know, there is something beneficial about getting together with your peers. You know, that scripture talks about iron sharpening iron. And so what I have found the benefit of this is that as we get together, as we have fellowship, as we talk, I hear what kind of challenges they are facing and how they're dealing with it. It may be a total different challenge from what I'm dealing with today. They hear from me what challenges I'm facing, how I'm dealing with it. And it may be total different challenges from what they are facing. But as we share our hearts, as we share what God is saying to us, as we share what we hear the Spirit of the Lord ministering to the congregations about, we get encouragement, we glean from one another, we receive strength from one another. And uh, I just believe that that can help you have a better balance, a better perspective, and to be better prepared to be an effective minister. So our peer groups, getting together, having fellowship with other ministers. And my final point is number five, and this is critical, rest, R-E-S-T. And I saved it for last because it is so critical. There are way too many ministers that I know who are not healthy because they don't rest and they don't take care of themselves. Listen to me tonight. If God took a Sabbath, you need to take a Sabbath. If God rested, you need to rest. You know, I've got a very good friend who is a, a doctor. He's helped a, a lot of ministers who have battled life-threatening diseases. And one of the things that he, he tells me is a majority of these ministers do not rest enough. Two common denominators, poor diet, lack of rest. Poor diet, lack of rest. Many times the poor diet is a result of running. Going, 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 going. That's a result of this delegation issue we talked about at number three, not handing things off, trying to do everything yourself. Remember, Jesus died for the church. You don't need to. And so he said, poor diet and lack of rest. See, you need at least a day a week where that there's no appointments, there's no phone calls, there's no meetings, there's no projects, so you can relax, you can unwind, you can recharge your batteries. Listen, if you like to fish, go fishing. If you like to play golf, go chase the little white ball around, all right? I call it a prayer walk. <laughs> if you like gardening, uh, read a book, whatever it is, do it. Take some rest. Let me throw this in here just before I wrap up. It is that there's this category called vacation. Vacation. And I'm amazed at how many ministers do not take a vacation. They only take a vacation to go preach at a friend's church or in a conference or something like that hold a series of, of, of meetings. Let me tell you, that's not a vacation. And if the truth is known, listen to me, your spouse hates that. All right? Are, are, are you following me? You need to rest. If you get three weeks vaca vacation time, use all three weeks of them. Take that time, do something. Go somewhere with your spouse. Go somewhere with your family. Enjoy yourself. You need to rest. And here's the thing I want to leave with you. Your vehicle has four tires on it. If just one of those tires get out of balance, it could be something as small as one ounce of weight. One ounce of weight falls off one of those wheels. 
that 3,000 or 4,000 pound automobile you're driving is gonna ride bad, it's gonna vibrate, it might shake at certain speeds. Why? Because something is out of balance. God has a great plan for your life and ministry. Let's just keep it in balance. God bless you. Hello again, and I pray that this night has been a blessing to each and every one of you who have tuned in. Again, thank you for joining us, and be sure to join us tomorrow night, remember, 7.30 Central Standard Time for night three of this great Leadership Summit. So have others join you, uh, staff members, other ministers that you know that might need this information. We would be happy to have them watch this with you. So come back and let God prepare you that when the churches are getting back to full speed, we come back into revival, not just survival. God bless you and thank you for joining us.